we're ready. Hey, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show. It's a month of May already, and uh, uh, well, we uh, continue with my interview series, of course, because that's what we do here on the Frankie Slauson Show. We mix it up, and today we got a very interesting guest, a guy who, uh, you know, you can say that I have a love for movies and stuff like that, and a love for pop culture, but this guy, he literally has a love for pop culture because he does it in his uh, show called Flick Nation, and uh, his name is Dennis Willis. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that uh, this worked out, and that uh, you're a very prop guy, that uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said yes right away instead of thinking about it. <laughs> you caught me between projects, actually. This last week has been absolutely insane, and like the last few days, I've just gone, ah, okay, I'm just going to put my feet up and drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I suppose, you know, I mean, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you live in California, but uh, did you do some stuff for WGN or something like that? Because I was on your website, and it, and it said, like, WGN uh, Chicago. Did you work for them or something? No, no, I didn't work for them, but I um, they call me occasionally, and I'll, I'll come on as a guest to talk about movies. And it's, it's kind of fun, actually, because I first um, did some WGN stuff when my pal Greg Jarrett. Greg Jarrett used to work at KGO Radio, and then he, um, he got a job at, WGN, and he was their morning guy, so he'd call me occasionally, and then he lost his job, and I thought, well, that's, you know, never going to happen again, yeah. and then all of a sudden, they called a couple of months later, and they said, hey, we got your name in the thing, and you want to be on, and, well, sure, and I've actually spoken to three or four hosts um, in the morning and at night, and so, um, I, I'm, I'm honored to be part of the roster, I mean, that's, you know, Chicago, that's Roger Ebert town, you oh, know, yeah. so if... That's 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 when you're talking about film criticism. That's you know, it, it all comes from right there. So it's fun. It's it's a lot of fun. So it's something that, that you hear on the radio, but not on the t the television network itself. No, no, no. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's WGN radio. Okay, because I uh, yeah. we got we get see I I live in North Minnesota, so we get uh, WGN on channel twenty on our on our box anyway so <laughs> oh okay cool you used to cool. watch WGN a lot back in the days uh, when they showed uh, Bozo the Clown a lot <laughs> you know it's funny I I seem to recall WGN being on our cable system at some point I remember um, maybe they just take it for baseball games but yeah I have a vague it's, it's in the cobwebs but I, I think we got WGN out here in California okay uh, a while back I don't know yeah it's hard to say but uh, well yeah that's, that's pretty interesting uh and uh, you know, speaking of Robert or Roger Ebert, I mean, everybody knows that he just recently passed away not too long ago. And I, I listened to your uh, your part of your radio show that you did uh, when the week that he died, or or, when, or the day after he died, or when you whatever you did it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was I was pretty excited to hear about it because uh, you guys really co you and your friend Stephen Kirk really covered a lot of a lot of ground when it comes to the knowing a lot about uh, about his legacy and stuff. Well, it's Steve Kirk and it's Steve Wagner. It's funny, I work with two Steves, both Capricorns. We confuse them all the time, so we just <laughs> use their last names. Um, but uh, Steve Wagner and I hosted a show uh, about 15 years ago, a TV show. Um, that and, and that's how we got together to do the uh, to do to the movie critic thing. Um, and ultimately, we ended up in some of the same circles at junkets and early screenings. And so he'd had the chance to meet them uh, a few times. I never have. I never did. And so he met Siskel and Ebert at the NAPTI convention. And he told that story, and and he saw Titanic with them. And uh, you know, he. So it's it's funny. You know, you do something like this, you you end up crossing paths with people who do the same thing. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, Roger's legacy is tremendous. I, I, I still read his his stuff. I mean, he just has has thousands and th seven thousand reviews and blogs, and you know, he lived such a um, a present internet life. So you know, every day there was something new to read, and 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 it's uh, what a loss of a voice, you know. Yeah, and it's kind of too bad too that uh, during the last five or ten years of his life, or that he, you know, had cancer, and then he what he lost his jaw or the bottom part of yeah. his jaw and stuff like that. It's almost the same like what uh, what Bobby the Brain Heenan's kind of going through. Almost the same, what, what same thing kind of. Hmm. Well, you know what's fascinating about Roger is that um, that's when his voice really came alive. As soon as he couldn't 
do the TV show anymore. He stepped it up in terms of he just embraced the Internet and became one with it, you know, and that's when he became so prolific. I mean, you know, the autobiography and all the books and the reviews, and I don't know that he necessarily, he, he's always sort of been, you know, ahead of the curve, but I don't know if he would have been that ahead of the curve if nature hadn't forced its hand, you uh-huh. know. Yeah, and can you say that uh, he was, like, one of your, like, maybe he and, and Gene Siskel were, like, some of your inspirations to, to the movie Love, kind of? Well, I, I think, I, I you know, it's like we said on the show, I think that anybody who talks about movies, there's a trickle-down. It's like you can't, you can't paint without necessarily looking at great painters, and so absolutely what came before informs what comes later, and so, and Siskel and Ebert were so... Um, the, you know, their, their TV show was ubiquitous. It was two thumbs up. Even though we initially tried to distance ourselves, oh, no, we're different from them. We do this and this. I mean, <laughs> yeah. come on, you know. It's two guys sitting in chairs talking about movies. And anytime you've got something that's as simple as that, you just, it is what it is. You know, you're not going to be any better or, or, or you know, or than that. And so the question is, can you bring your own style or your own your own flavor to it? And I, and I know that, uh, like myself, you know, I've always been a big fan of, like, you know, movies from the, you know, I'm only 29, so I've, I've always been a big fan of movies from, like, the uh, the 80s and the 90s, especially just because of the, the type of the way things were back in those days before. I mean, even though special effects took a big part in some of the movies, but, like, I always liked, like, Back to the Future and Ghostbusters and stuff like that. And I remember listening to or watching some of their reviews on those movies, and, and I think that kind of helped, in a way, kind of give... Uh, the, these movies, uh, the legacy that they've uh, that they've had, kind of. To a degree, I mean, you're you're right. Critical um, critical thinking uh, definitely informs everybody's like, ah, if the critics liked it, I'm gonna hate it. Whatever, <laughs> you know, that's kind of a popular dissenting thing you've always heard. But when I was um, <clears throat> I was I was ten years old when the first Star Wars movie came out, and of course it just blew my mind and changed my life. And so I was. 13 when The Empire Strikes Back came out and loved it and it was amazing and all that stuff but I was 16 when Jedi came out and I remember I, I saw it and I was underwhelmed and I remember thinking wow this is not even the same kind of magic and I thought well maybe I'm I started thinking well I'm 16 I'm in the music I'm in the girls I'm into a whole I'm in the horror movies I'm into all these other <laughs> things now and maybe it's just not the same for me and so I, I thought that was the case for a long time and then I, I bought a book Hey, I had a garage sale, maybe. I ended up getting a used copy of a Pauline Kael book. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. I still have it sitting on my, my, my rack here, and it's called Taking It All In, and she reviews all the three Star Wars movies. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll read her reviews. And the first one, she loved it, totally magical, wonderful. Second one, uh, a deepening of the mythology. And the third one, she just crapped all over and said, this movie only exists to sell toys. And then she went right on down the list of all the narrative strands that were dropped and not followed up on. And that's, that was kind of like a, a moment for me where I was, I think I was 20 when I read that, and it was just like, oh, yeah, okay, it wasn't just me. And, and, and to actually see somebody else articulate the reasons why something um, worked or didn't work, it's not that it helped form my opinion necessarily, but it's like, oh, here's a set of tools for critical thinking. And I was like, oh, okay. And I love that. I, I love being able to uh, uh, crack something open and look at it from a, a, a different perspective. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I can throw <laughs> on a slot or fart comedy and, and <laughs> laugh my ass off. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, Caddyshack is one of my all-time favorite movies. So is Smokey and the Bandit. Sure. But those movies aren't trying to be anything other than what they are. Yep. You know? So, like, you know, a, a movie that aims a little higher comes out. I, I love being able to pull out my bag of tools and go, okay, now why why can't I stop thinking about that? Why is that rattling around in my head and just kind of climbing into it to see, you know, whether the movie works on that level? So I, I find all that stuff fascinating. Yeah, and, and that's just a thing, too. And I, I kind of wonder, you know, and maybe you wonder this, too, is like, like how, like, the younger generation now, you know, they kind of missed out on a lot of, uh, well, I mean, they, they've been a part of a few cool things that have happened in the film industry, but, but like, back in the day, like, like, you know, when you grew up and when I grew up and stuff like that, it's like, you know, they missed out on uh, a lot of cool cool movies that really, even though you can see it now on Blu-ray or DVD, but, like, to, to be there when it, like, came out and stuff. I mean, do you think uh, do you think that has any impact on future generations as far as uh, what's, what's to come and what, uh, 
what uh, these uh, younger generations uh, have missed out on? Well, that's a great question. I mean, when Star Wars came out and I was 10, all I heard grown-ups talk about at the time were, you know, well, you know, Gone with the Wind was the biggest movie ever until this. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, you know, there's always going to be something bigger, better, more popular that comes along. And the question is... Um, things are changing so much in terms of, you know, I see people, I just read a tweet today that said, I've, I've watched all the Mad Men episodes on my phone. And I'm just like, dude, are you serious? You know, it's like, how can you, I guess because I appreciate, I've worked on sets, I've produced TV, I know what's setting up a shot, and I know the effort that goes into making sure that that shot looks brilliant. You know, or as good as it can be, and 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 then you, and, and and that's and so, so it looks good on a, a big screen. If not, if not that, on a big screen in your house, yeah. you know, and there's people walking, you know, like watching stuff on phones. I suppose that's the inevitability of it, but I hope it doesn't affect the. I hope the crowd lazier because everything's getting smaller. You know, uh, if that makes any sense. No, I, no, I totally agree because it's like. Back in the day, you didn't have, like, tablets and stuff where you could watch movies on and stuff. Back in the day, you actually had to go to the theater and watch it or go to the video rental store and, and rent it. And, and now it's like things, it's changed so much. And, and I don't know if it hurts the film industry or not because, I, you know, I, I, too, I tro totally believe that people are making their money that need to make it. But it's like, it's just uh, the ways of uh, accessing things are so different now compared to how it used to be. Well, it, it also kind of trickles down into the types of films that get made because somebody figured out 10, 15 years ago that you could make more money at the global box office than you can here in this country. And so that's why this weekend the big story is that Iron Man 3 made $195 million everywhere else but here. That's why movies get released everywhere else but America first. And because there's more money out there. And so you go, okay, well, what, what sells in other countries? People talking? No giant robots that's what <laughs> translates you know what I mean it's like because you don't that's not a cultural thing you could have giant robots destroying a city you can have big spectacle so if it's a if, it, if it's a brand name if it's something that travels effortlessly from country to country and all you have to do is throw up some subtitles or a new track those are the kind of movies that a studio would rather it's easier to get 200 million dollars for a giant robot movie than it is to get 2 million dollars for a character driven film with great performances and great writing which is why you've got you know Kickstarter now is becoming the home of Veronica Mars and Zach Braff uh -huh. you know because studios don't want to make those movies and, and that's why a lot of those movies are going straight to video on demand because the idea is that grown up audiences don't want to pay 20 dollars a ticket and see it in 3D they just want to watch it yeah, you know, and so I think that phenomenon is going to continue to grow too. Where what we get on the big screen is just going to continue to get bigger, louder, you know, 3D. But I think the quality, and I, you know, and the other thing is that TV is awesome right now. And so if you you look, you know, if you kind of extrapolate that out, where the giant robot movies are on screen, but the character-driven stuff and the character actors are moving to television. And now you've got things like House of Cards on Netflix. It's like the whole idea of storytelling is cheap, yeah. you know, and it's not so much about the big two-hour movie as it is maybe about a 10-hour story on Netflix, you know, or, 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 you know, a limited series or a mini-series. On the one hand, it's kind of exciting, but on the other hand, you're absolutely right when you say, um, are the kids going to miss out on a big theatrical moment? Well, they might. You know, it's like an Avatar or a Titanic or a Star <laughs> Wars. Those only come along. The really special ones only come along once every few years. Yeah. You know? So, uh, so what do you think about remakes? I mean, are you a big fan of remakes, or or do you not uh, enjoy remakes? You know, um, I'm of two minds because <laughs> they've been making Shakespeare films out of Shakespeare for a long, long time, uh -huh. and, and nobody really seems to complain about that. Um, and, and they, we've been covering songs forever, you know? And so the nature of, of a quality piece being reinterpreted, I have no problem with. Uh, if it's a great piece, a pliable piece, you know, it's like, fine, set, set Shakespeare as a, as, a, as a gang film with crazy music. Okay, I'm great. You know, if it's, a, if it's a new way to look at something, I'm all good with it. But what I do not like, and I'm not a fan of, is 
this idea that just because a studio owns it, like, well, we made the movie 20 years ago and we own the logo, so let's make it now because we don't have to pay for something new. And then you get all these PG-13 horror movies or you get... You know, these things that are rebooted, like Spider-Man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 the first one was good. The second one was great. The third one was <laughs> Sell Toys. But five <laughs> years later, we get a reboot <clears throat> yeah. with, with an origin story. It's like, I don't care how good that movie is in places. It's still ten years after the original. That is way too soon, you know? Yeah, and I, I just, I kind of don't understand why. I mean, I enjoyed... The, the Amazing Spider-Man, it was great. I watched it in theater and everything, but it's like they pretty much it was pretty much the same as the first one uh, that exactly. with Tobey Maguire, yeah. and I just like uh, okay, uh, I thought this was supposed to be totally different than the Spider-Man series or whatever. I thought they were going to take a James Bond approach with it and just like here's a Spider-Man adventure with a yeah. different guy, and let's keep moving forward now. Yeah, but. I don't know. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you said you uh, you've done some sets for some movies, and you produce or you helped produce some movies. What are some uh, big name movies? Well, I've produced some. I, I produced video. Um, okay. I, I had a TV show. Steve Kirk and I uh, we did a show for 25 years here in the Bay Area called Sound Waves. Uh -huh. And I'm not like you know 100 years old. I started when I was 16, so that was kind of awesome. Um, we wrapped up the show five years ago. And uh, and so and, and, and it got incrementally better as it went. Um, but we do a thing every year called Soundwaves Christmas, which is uh, an annual food, clothing, and toy drive, and it airs on a bunch of stations. We have an incredible crew, and the um, it's it's kind of a variety show. It's a rock and roll variety show, but the idea and is to spotlight um, not only uh, talent, but uh, to collect uh, goods and to redistribute them into the community. It's 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 a it's a great show. And I'm very happy to be doing it, but um, I'm blown away by the people um, that have become a part of our regular crew. Their attention to detail uh, is just unbelievable, and I, I, part of the reason why I love producing is to to work with these guys. You know, because it's just a, it's like best idea in the room wins, and it seems like we're always challenging each other. You know, uh, and these guys, these guys, you know, I know what I know, and there's things that I'm good at, but there's a lot that I'm not, and so to have these folks step in, uh, uh, people who I'm, I'm used to work with who are just great at set design or lighting or, uh, 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 you know, direction, and these are not strengths. So when I see it done well, it's it's a pleasure to be a part of, you know? Yeah, and, and, and I totally agree with that. You know, it's like it's like when you when you work with a good crew, you know, the good quality is going to... A good quality of work is going to show, and uh, and you know you're not working with a bunch of rookies. You're probably working with people that actually even you know care a lot about the film industry, other than just oh let's make a million dollars and, and get the hell out of here. You know. Well, this is a volunteer gig. It's it's mainly you know, none of us make a penny on it, and all the money that we get from sponsors, and we've you know occasionally get corporate sponsors, and we distribute that right back out. We pay for the show, and if we've got a you know thousand dollars, two thousand dollars left over. We'll pass out checks to some uh, nonprofits, okay. and uh, it is just and it, it's great to do it. I love the show. And and, uh, and, and then I, I noticed uh, what we, we were talking about before I hit the record button that you uh, got to do an interview with Marlon Wayans to uh, help promote the uh, uh, Haunted House movie, uh, which finally came out on Blu-ray and DVD not too long ago. Uh, mm -hmm. It's hard to believe how quickly that that happens now, but because uh, the movie came out in January, but. Uh, how did that uh, come about for people who uh, don't know the story? Uh, that was fun, actually. That was that almost didn't happen, and it ended up being kind of a big deal for us. Um, the way it works is that um, for our radio thing, uh, people come to town, they do press tours, and then the invitations go out. You know, and are you interested in talking to so and so on the state? And then you have to see the movie. And at the time, um, Soundwave's Christmas was going to air in, uh, it aired on 12th, 12th last year. So it was going to air on the 12th. The interview was like uh, a week before that. And we had just shot the last round that Saturday. If you watch that interview, my voice is completely shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of looked um, like that a little bit. <laughs> we, uh, the way it happened was I, the rep got a hold of me and she says, you know, we're only asking a few people, do you want to talk to Marlon Wayans? Well, you know, video and everything. And I, I would love to, but it's right in the middle of all this, and, and, and this, I mean, literally, like, within a day of production, and I'm deep in editing, and I said, I am not going to have the time. I can't. And she leaned on me, and I was like, and then it just occurred to me, 
like, wait a minute, if we can get something out of this. So I said, okay, tell you what, how about this? We'll make the time, we'll cover the hell out of the movie, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun if we can get Marlon to do a shout-out for our Christmas show. And it went back and forth for about seven or eight days. It's amazing how long it takes to get an answer to something as trivial as that. But oh, sure. it went back and forth between Jimin and, and the production. Or the, it's just crazy. So finally, they're, you know, they said, yeah, yeah, he'll do it. Awesome. So we came, we did the interview, and, uh, and then we, uh, after the interview, he sat right there in the same chair, did an introduction for Soundwave's Christmas, and he did a commercial. Oh, wow. And he was awesome to work with. It was it was great. And then we got to promote that Marlon Wayans was on, on Soundwave's Christmas, which drove our numbers up and, and just kind of added a little, uh, little extra sizzle to it. So Marlon was awesome. He's great. And uh, here's... <laughs> And I've told this story before, too. The movie, you know, able to laugh at art comedy. Sure. Um, this movie, uh, have you seen it? I have not seen it yet, but I, I'm going to be renting it tonight. I wanted, to, I wanted to see it. Watch it with a group of people who are uh, exactly. I saw it in a little screening room with yeah. a bunch of stuffy Bay Area critics, and nobody laughed. Oh, jeez. And it's not... It was a great movie. Yeah. There are, are gags that go on wrong. There are stuff that you've seen before. But it is. I mean, there's parts. Of, I was laughing my ass off. I was giggling my ass off by myself in this room. And I thought, you know, these other people just, like, <laughs> enjoy anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, see, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to a, a, a place in Bemidji, Minnesota, uh, that was showing uh, the release of Scary Movie 5. So they also did like a, a parody of uh, Paranormal Activity 2, but also mixing it with like Mama and then a couple other spoofs oh, as right, well. Right. But uh, is it almost as funny as Scary Movie 5, or, or have you seen Scary Movie 5? I, I have not seen Scary Movie 5. They didn't preview that for critics. And so for me, a big indicator is if they don't show it to critics, I kind of go, eh, you know, okay. well, maybe they just don't want people to see it. But I kind of wonder, you know, like, you know, because uh, I, I don't really, I don't know. I mean, I, I try to stay away from criti critic reviews if it's somebody that, uh, like, makes it seem like the movie is horrible and makes it seem like, oh, don't go see this movie. It's, it's nothing but crap, crap, crap. But then you go see it, then you have fun and you enjoy it, and it's like, what the heck's wrong with this person? You know, you know just like you said, do they like anything at all? And it's just like, why, you know, why give you a good movie, you know? Well, I mean, and and it's funny. Whenever I give, uh, whenever I give talks in front of people, one thing I say, my opinion is just my, yeah. my opinion, no more than yours. And oftentimes, it's, you know, public taste always dictate when something is. You can have the most brilliant move that doesn't catch a wave, and it's, you can have crack, and people will it up. I mean, and I I say as a joke that McDonald's is the most popular restaurant in America. Yeah. Well, McDonald's, I don't even qualify as actual food. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you know, it is, it, you know, I mean, mission that, that it's a success. And so, at the end, at the end of the day, it's all subjective. You know, all, it, it, critics can speak for all, I can off. I don't count it. If I'm going to pop in a D, if I'm going to drag my to the city, and I'm in four hours watching a two-hour movie, and even though we see them for free, it's still 20 bucks to park, it's still, you know, it's still, uh, 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 ended. I don't want my time wasted. I'm not trying to be smarter than anybody else. I want to walk out of that movie going, at least I laughed, or I cried, or I was uh. engaged, or I was pissed off, or I was something. But when I, for me, when I see the same movie over and over, with the same ending, with the same beats, with the same <gasps> surprise reveal character. You know, the thing <laughs> is that most people watch a movie a week or, mo or two movies a month. When uh, you watch four movies in a week, you start to spot similarities a lot faster. And I think, to defend critics, I think that that's why critics get grumpy. We see the same stuff over yeah, right. and over and over again. And it's not that it's getting any better, it's, it's, it's getting more watered down. And I never understood that until I watched four to six movies a week. And then all of a sudden you realize, wow, this is really a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, because most people watch entertainment to be entertained, you yeah. know? And, and that's all it is. It's putting their feet up and it's forgetting about a hard day and they're watching whatever they're in the mood for. 
which is generally not the most sophisticated thing, and that's cool. There's a there's a total that that exists for a reason, you know. Uh, there's a reason why people watch Scary Movie Five. Is that for me? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Well, um, I th- yeah, but. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm not in a hurry for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of uh, skeptical too a little bit about it because I I saw Scary Movie One and Two, which I, I I love those two because they're 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 a lot funny because of the Wayans brothers and everything. It's part mm-hmm. three and part four I didn't see because I, it didn't look good to it didn't look that funny to me. Even though it had Leslie Nielsen and George Carlin and and Charlie Sheen. But part five actually did that made me laugh a lot, and, and because it had a lot of funny scenes that I was not expected at all, and it just uh, I don't know it, it was just it was just good. Yesterday or not yesterday, but the day before on uh, Friday, uh, I got to go and see the movie Pain Again, and the reason why I went and saw Pain Again basically not just because of The Rock or whatever. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a while, I get the honor of doing an interview with Larry Hankin. Is that a familiar name to you? Um, it is, but tell me why. Uh, well, he uh, he uh, is in the movie. He has a, a small little part in that movie, Pain and Gain. But that's not the reason why I was, I'm going to be interviewing him. I'm interviewing him because he, of it, you know, pretty much like how I'm interviewing you, because you're doing something cool in the entertainment business. You're, you know, he's a he's a comic actor. He played, like, Mr. Heckles and, and Friends. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I know who you're talking and about. And then uh, right. he was also Billy Madison as well as uh, Crazy Carl and everything, if you remember uh, the, sure, the movie. right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, cool. I went to see the movie to see what, you know, I was basically eager to see what part he played because I tried to look it up on the internet to see what part Larry Hankin played in movie because he wouldn't tell me at all he wanted to keep it a surprise so i i see the part he was like the priest or whatever he played a part of a priest and i thought that was pretty cool just to see him on the big screen but my my, my point about this was that uh i saw a review that somebody did on paid again uh making fun of the director you know they always like to criticize michael bay and i don't think he's that bad of a director but because he uh, directed this movie paid again they didn't want to give him crap about it <laughs> well, Michael Bay, let's face it, you know, Michael Bay makes Mick movies. He's the one who makes the giant robot movies, yeah. you know? And I think this was his attempt at, I, I remember when this deal went down, he said he would do Transformers 3 if he could make this movie for $25 million. And that kind of goes back to my point that I made earlier, that um, the studios, they don't want to make character-driven movies, unless it's to win Oscars at the end of the year. Um, you know, it, uh, almost every movie that emerges as a simple character drama, you know, you always hear about how hard it was to get it made. And I, I, he, he built it into his Transformers 3 uh, contract that he got to make this. He'll do this, but, you know. And so, um, was it 3 or 4? Maybe it was 4. Don't quote me on that, but sure. it was one of the Transformers movies. Yeah, probably he, part three. He would do if, you know. I think it was so part three. I haven't three, seen Pain and Game. We've got the San Francisco Film Festival going on oh. right now, and um, I switched over to cover that, and so I, I was, I was spared. But I'm not a Michael Bay fan. I, 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 I hope that I'm not trying to bash him because I, you know, I, I, I he's probably got a great movie in him somewhere, and I, I, maybe this is it. I don't know, but you know, the thing about art and artists and filmmakers and writers and everybody, you look you look at everybody who was ever bashed. You look at everybody who was ever called the worst at something. And they've got something great on their resume. In almost every single case, you find me the worst of anybody, and they've done something, they've done at least one thing that's amazing, uh-huh. that everybody can agree is amazing. And the flip side of that is you look at the greatest filmmakers, the greatest actors, the greatest writers, and they've got stuff on their resume that, and usually the later stuff, when they get lazy, that they don't want anybody to see either. You know, you look at James sure. Cameron, and James Cameron made Piranha 2. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I, you know, you look at John Sayles, who's an incredible filmmaker, and he and, 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 and he's made monster movies with people in rubber suits. You know, uh-huh. I think he made like, I, don't, I, I can't remember it now, Humanoids from the Deep or something like that. But, I mean, the thing is, it's completely subjective. And, and, and Michael Bay has just made a very loud career of feature-length trailers. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like he's not trying to make anything of substance. And so that works for him. A lot of people <laughs> don't like it. You know, I don't like the Transformers movies. I mean, I thought, I just, I just didn't. Oh, you know, okay. It wasn't for me. So you were never a fan of the series when it came out, or the the cartoon series at all? No, that kind of it got past me. No, I know a lot of folks were, and uh, I didn't mind the first one so much. In fact, there was actually something about 
Michael Bay and his sensibilities and the idea of these giant robots and the technology that kind of worked. And so I, I kind of dug the first one from that perspective. And then the second one just made me angry. You oh, know, it's oh. like I, I, it was one of those things where the, I don't know. I, you know, it's just the second one. I was I was in such a bad mood after I saw it. It was like two hours and forty minutes of uh, another critic actually said, "I'm going to steal this line." It was like uh, over two hours of rocks in a dryer. <laughs> <laughs> wow! And it's just like the racist robots and the you know. It's like oh, come on, you know. It's like oh. who's this movie for? And it just irritated me. So since we're talking about movies and stuff like that, I, I you know once again, if you're wondering who we're talking to, we're talking to Mr. Dennis Willis. I don't think he's any uh, relation to Bruce Willis at all, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, we have similar hair, but I, I can't say we make the same just yet. <laughs> but uh, you, you've uh, been doing a show called Flick. Flick Nation. I think what since like 2009, I believe, or so. Or? Yeah, I. Um it's funny, like anything else I've I've ended up doing, it's ended up starting up as an accident. Uh, we didn't set out to do a show. We actually, we like working together. Uh, Steve Wagner and I did this, uh, um, we did a show called Real Life, which became another show called Film Trip. And, um, and then he went on and did something else. He became uh, uh, the director of an art gallery here in the city. Oh. And I continued on doing the radio thing. And, um... I took a bunch of reviews and I put out a book in 2009. Uh, it was like the Flick Nation, um, I forget what it was called, Movie Guide. Oh. And so, uh, just a bunch of capsule reviews, and that was that was fun, but that's when we started to ask ourselves, you know, like, hmm, you know, there's, there's kind of a brand here, this is kind of interesting. And so we, uh, because I had access to equipment and, and, and did the radio thing, we thought, well, let's do a show. And so, we started uh, doing a podcast, which and it's just continued to uh, to grow, um, and our access now is incredible. The studios love us, and we're giving away prizes. We're giving we're we're, we're hosting screenings. I'm particularly excited. Um, you know William Friedkin, of course, the director of The Exorcist. Yeah, I'm uh, a little familiar to, with him. Yeah, uh, incredible filmmaker, and um, he's. We're actually hosting, um, not hosting, co-hosting. We're co-presenting co, a screening co, co. <laughs> with, uh, that was set up from uh, Tim Sika and the San Francisco Film Critics Circle. And it's a screening of his movie, Sorcerer. Okay. And he's, it's going to be a book signing and, and all kinds of stuff. So our little, our little brand, our little Flick Nation brand has grown on, on Facebook and Twitter and now into Flick Nation Radio. And we're just having a blast. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and it sounds like a fun little podcast or radio show because I like how you use the the retro sound clips and stuff because it's it's really if you're t especially if you're talking about a topic like that you know when, when you go back in the day and it, you know like uh, listen to your review or your you and uh, Stephen Kirk talking about uh, the li life of Roger Ebert and Gene S Sistel, uh hearing those old little reviews those audio reviews on your podcast, do you get, like, permission to use stuff like that, or do you have to pay copyright fees? For that? Well, no, I mean, uh, something like that is, is fairly readily available, and if it's in a historical context, or in, I mean, using songs are different, yeah. using lyrics are different, there's ASCAP and BMI stuff, but I, I've, there's never really been an issue of, like, somebody dies and you using a piece of footage, you know, especially okay. if it's in the public consciousness. I am no legal expert on this, I'm just telling you that this has never been an issue for us. Um, but I know that, you know, and, and there's other um, official sites um, that we pull a lot of stuff from. Like, uh, there's one called EPK.TV where, um, like, just about any film in the last, you know, few years that's had an ad campaign, you can pull, you know, you can call up the clip and go, I, I need this clip as an MP3 or I need this clip. Oh. It's a wonderful service. Uh, before they used to send you bulky tapes and stuff, and sure. <clears throat> it's crazy, you know, you have like warehouses full of tapes, <laughs> but now, you know, if I'm talking about a pain and gain, you know, yeah. and I need the trailer, I go to EPK.TV, I hit a button and I download the trailer. Oh, okay, that's pretty it's cool. very cool. So, uh, now we get to the part of the interview where I ask you if you have anything you would like to promote at all. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know, I, I think I would just want to uh, uh, ask folks to check out our Flick Nation uh, page on Facebook. We update it all the time. We give away prizes to new likes uh, on a weekly basis. We've got a fleet of DVDs and Blu-rays that show up, so what we do is we uh, we tend to bribe slash reward our new likes with uh, 
by picking a name out of the hat. We're always sending stuff out. We've got shirts to give away from the movie Trance. We've got uh, we're giving away Jurassic Park um, 3D right now. Yeah, I saw that. Um, <laughs> and same thing with Twitter. Uh, and just check us out. We do. Uh, I think we do a fun show, and uh, and you know, spread the word. We're trying to get our likes and our hits up, and and all that stuff. So. Well, that's cool. That's that's, that's really cool. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, kind of neat to to know that there's people that love that there's still people out there that love films, and I think, uh, you know, I think it's just amazing, because I live in an area, you know, I'm not trying to bash my hometown or anything, but it's like, <laughs> I live in an area where we're, we're, we're a little small-minded, more or less, like, we, we think about tractors, and we think about farming, and we think about <laughs> being a teacher or a bank worker, you know, and we don't really think outside that box, or let's go work in a factory for a week or whatever for the rest of our lives. Myself... Uh, just recently, the uh, the local uh, paper from my hometown mm-hmm. recently wrote an article about me, be, about my interviews that I've done and everything. You know, because I'm oh, the, nice. cool. I'm the only one in, the, in this area besides one other person that I know that's doing exactly what I'm doing, and I'm not even getting paid for it as well. I'm doing it all because it's just the love of the work, more or less, for my YouTube show. Well, welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'd be surprised. You know who's out there and and not making what you think they are. Yeah. You know, myself included. Um, but that's the thing. It's this is a very very exciting time to be doing what you're doing because and I'm doing. I mean the thing is uh, it, the internet is the great equalizer and anybody can 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 strike a chord if you just are doing what people want to hear. I mean you know and that's the thing. You you scratch around a little bit. We we ask ourselves every week. You know is there how can we make this more engaging, more entertaining? What what you know how can we and and if you're not asking yourself that question you're not growing creatively you know if you're not looking for the best way but yeah I mean now anybody can if you've got a good product if you've got a good you could put anything on YouTube you know uh, the technology is, is is there to do anything you want it's very very cool right now and one last question that I want to ask before we uh, conclude this interview from one movie lover to another, I got a pretty good size collection. Do you have a pretty good uh, movie collection at your house? <laughs> I do, and um, I, my family owned a video store for 20 years. Okay. And so we, when we closed the store, I basically brought home, I don't know, a few hundred of my favorite movies. <laughs> and uh, eventually, and, and then we started getting movies from studios because we're, you know, yeah. w- for review purposes and whatnot. And so now I'm... I'm st- I've I've actually had to rotate because I don't want my you know my friend John Stanley who did Creature Features here for years. You go into his downstairs area and literally around the walls, like on every single wall, floor to ceiling, are movies. And while on the one hand that's cool, um, I don't want my entire house covered in movies. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got one one um, wall size uh, uh, shelf, yeah. and I rotate the old ones into the garage and I, I keep the, the newer ones or the ones that I want to have on the wall up. So my garage needs organizing. <laughs> so so uh, when you watch the movies, do you prefer to watch them? Do you have like a surround sound system or a nice big screen TV or do you watch them or how do you watch a movie when you when you just feel like watching it? Well, that's a good question. I um, I have to tell you, I as much as I just bash the idea of watching stuff on the phone, I, I watch movies on my tablet sometimes. Oh, okay. With phones. Sure, sure. Awesome. <laughs> Um, but I also, you know, yeah, I've got the big screen. I uh, I try to skew Blu-ray, you know, as yeah. much as I can, um, or, or digital over, say, DVD, because I'm just like a dork that way. Oh, um, sure. I like a great picture, but, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, uh, I've i watched movies. We get, sometimes if we're going to interview somebody, we get um, online screeners with the the password and everything. And oh, the yeah. Streaming quality is not the best. Sure. But Sometimes if you need to see something, you just need to see it. Yeah, and, and like with me, you know, I, I prefer, I, I don't know, when it comes to buying Blu-rays and stuff like that, especially, I prefer to watch a lot of the older movies because, you know, new, new movies of today are great and stuff, and, I, and, I, and I'm a fan too, but it's like, yeah, I like going back to the days of the old quality, like like the way VHS used to be, how it used to be all uh, scratchy and you had to do the tracking and all that on the VCR. And now, you know, when you watch, like, say, if you own, like, the Back to the Future original VHS and then you watch the Back to the Future Blu-ray, holy crap. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's tremendous. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's awesome. My son is seven, and I've been, you know, it's 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 kind of like that interesting dance. It's like, well, what do I show him? What's age appropriate? And yeah. so we've watched a handful of PG-13s that he can handle and other ones I'm sure that he couldn't, but uh, we, we've stayed away from. But he, I finally showed him the Back to the Future films, and he loves them. Oh, yeah. 
Oh my God! I, I sit here surrounded by plastic DeLoreans, and you know, uh, <laughs> he's he, he just it totally caught his imagination, and like he doesn't care about you know uh, when a movie was made or anything like that. Yeah. It's just it's it struck him in a way that maybe this you know refers back to your comment about kids today. Yeah. I think a good story is universal. Yeah. I think I I think if it's good and it's dry, it sparks that imagination. And it's well told. I think. I think it's eternal. Oh yeah. Know? Oh yeah. And, and and we gotta get more younger people involved in in liking like movies like Back to the Future and stuff like that because they were so you know they were so so good of a film. Uh, I mean, to me, I could watch it over and over again and learn something new every time. You know? Well, because of my son recently, I have watched it over <laughs> and over again, and it's, it's funny because. Um, the general consensus is that the first movie is perfect, which I would agree with, but yeah. then the other movies aren't as good. And I would actually say that when you when you watch all three together, yeah. they are so internally consistent with one another. But of course, having seen them a lot recently, I'm starting to spot holes. I'm like, <laughs> what about that second DeLorean that was back in 1885? Why didn't they use that for gas? <laughs> My son's like, yeah, uh, you yeah. Got me. <laughs> but you know, I tell you what, this has been a fun interview, and uh, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about movies. With, even if I've never met you in, in real life and all that stuff, it's still fun to to talk about movies for, with a with another movie lover, pretty much. Well, I was absolutely flattered when you made the request, and I thought that sounds like a whole lot of fun. And I, I, I always love talking movies. That's, it's the great conversation. You know, it's every, it's the one thing everybody has in common. Oh yeah, I mean, rather, I'd rather talk about movies all day long or pro wrestling all day long rather than talking about the news or bombings or you know anything that's negative because I try to stay away from the negative feedback of what you see in the news, and I try to make my show a little bit more interesting and entertaining if I can, so. Well, you do a good job, sir, and uh, again, <laughs> I think you're you're rocking it, and, and just, you, you're doing what you need to do, and you're doing it for the right reason, the love of the game, so this has been a blast for me, and I, I, I wish you nothing but success. Oh, well, thank you very much, and same to you, too, and uh, like I said, maybe we can try to convince uh, your good friend Stephen Kirk to come on, because I would love to talk to that guy. Uh, you know, he seems like a guy who, who loves Superman, loves Back to the Future, loves old movies. I mean, holy crap, this guy This guy looks amazing, just like you. <laughs> well, he's, uh, you know, I'm surprised he hasn't done your show. I will I will apply the uh, requisite <laughs> amount of peer pressure needed. <laughs> uh, I think we'll make this happen. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I tell you what, I appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, this was Dennis Willis. And uh, please check out his uh, show, The Flick Nation. And I'll, I'll put the links down below uh, when I make this interview live so that people can click on it and, and check your stuff out. Hey, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. You take care. All right, thanks, man. And that was Dennis Willis uh, from the show Flick Nation. Uh, and, yeah, it's it's definitely a very interesting uh, show uh, that Stephen Kirk and, and uh, whoever else, or Wagner, that they do together. I've listened to a few episodes, and I've been friends with Stephen Kirk for a while and Dennis Willis, and uh, it's amazing uh, that they just share love for films and and uh, we all share love for films here on YouTube, especially. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's fun to fun to learn about things that you know, that you have an interest in, in when you know there's other people that share the same interests rather than the same old same old all the time. It's it's neat. And and this is, guy was from uh, out of California, so it's kind of even makes it more neat because he's doing doing stuff with films. So anyway, I'm Frank Slauson, and uh, thanks for tuning in to this uh, latest interview. We'll have more great guests coming up real soon here for this month of May, this last month of Season 5 of the Frankie Slauson Show, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.